planet is a never-ending wonder. A million years would barely suffice to see all the sites nature has curated, and it would take another billion to truly comprehend their machinations and ecosystems. So, in our human shackles, we can but watch and try to use our time to admire these gardens of life while we are able to. Today, we will look at one of the most active corners of our globe, the New World, the expanse only recently discovered through the efforts of the Hunter's Guild. This massive continent and its surrounding islands have been the subject of much guild and research activity, and present a perfect place to experience the splendor of our world. This is in no small part due to the staggering diversity of the wildlife. From endemic unicates to familiar faces, the New World is home to over 70 large monsters, all with their own place in the ecosystem. In this documentary film, we will pay each of them a visit, discovering the miraculous and fascinating ways in which they live in this biological paradise. While every single one of them could and probably will fill their very own documentary episode, this film will serve as an extensive overview of all the wonders the new world has to offer. The New World is unique among the lands thus charted by the Guild. While many locales have exhibited unusual and even inexplicable phenomena across recorded Guild history, the New World's relationship with bioenergy has transformed it into the single most mystifying expanse within Hunter's territory. The relationships between the various biomes are tightly defined, and the ripple effects direct the life of millions of organisms. It is truly a place of marvelous beauty. But even within this uniqueness, the New World always worked around known rules of ecology. The Rotten Vale and the Coral Highlands are otherworldly landscapes, but their mechanisms are based on clear, well-understood biology. Despite its sometimes mystical appearance, it would take quite some time for the Research Commission to discover something truly beyond explanation. At the tail end of the Everworm investigation, the Commission sent out a recon unit to follow the tracks of an unusual Nergigante specimen that had played a key role in that incident. What should have been a routine expedition turned into a paradigm shift for the entire Commission, as the Nergigante in question flew far north, well past the Elder's Recess, to a remote island in the ocean, east of the New World's main landmass. This island, and its bizarre ecosystem would come to be known as the Guiding Lands. Upon the first landing, the Guiding Lands do not look like anything special, a rocky island with some lush green forests. But before long, things begin seeming odd. The forest may suddenly, within the span of a few meters, transition into a hot desert, which itself may sit atop a heap of corpses not unlike the Rotten Vale. And soon, the realization dawns. The Guiding Lands house microversions of every possible ecosystem found in the New World. The Ancient Forest, the Wildspire Waste, the Coral Highlands, the Rotten Vale, the Elder's Recess, the Hoarfrost Reach. Pockets of land mimicking all of these locales spring up in the Guiding Lands repeatedly, sometimes with entirely localized weather and climate, making these islands into miniature crystallizations of the main continent. This is, by all known ecology, inexplicable. While varied locales are certainly possible under the right conditions, basic biology should not allow for flora and climate of such different scopes to exist right next to each other. To this day, the Guiding Lands puzzle the Guild. However, despite its fantastical nature, this ecological wonder holds hints, traces of its truth that clue us in. 
It doesn't take long to realize that some of the fundamental structures within the Guiding Lands look off. A giant skull, a back shell the size of a mountain range, various oddly skeletal looking walls. The guild soon hypothesized that the entire Guiding Land island is not actually a naturally formed one, but instead the calcified and overgrown remains of one massive elder dragon. The gargantuan remains even reveal what species this might have been. An ancient, massive Zora Magdaros, a predecessor of the one the guild dealt with during the Elder Crossing. As walking volcanoes that live for eons, these behemoths are living suns fueled by and brimming with bioenergy. So, the theory goes, this old Zora Magdaros tried to do what the other one tried as well die at the Rotten Vale. For reasons we will never know, this individual however overshot its target by a lot, resurfacing in the middle of the Eastern Ocean, far away from its destined grave. Exhausted from the journey, the Zora must have perished where it stood, out in the vast ocean, where its expelled bioenergy cannot go anywhere. However, the unique biology of the Zora Magdaros might have been the key here. These giants are actually only a fraction of the visible size. The original body is slender, but as they age, they accumulate inorganic and mineral material on their backs, eventually forming the massive shells they are best known for. In other words, when this Zora Magdaros died, ready to release its bioenergy, it already had an island on its back, an island that would now be bombarded with so much bioenergy that its climate and soil will be permanently transformed and distorted. Due to this immense density of energy in a tight space, the way life sprung up and alternated ended up being fairly extreme. This leaves still no explanation as to why the biomes that spring up strictly mimic those on the main continent though. Some researchers have suggested that because the Zora Magdaros passed under the entire continent on its journey, it might have swam across the entire Everstream and been exposed to samples of bioenergy from every possible locale, samples it now cultivates posthumously. Some have also theorized that the Molly, a rodent that is the only truly endemic species of the Guiding Lands, might be involved in this. But they are not talking. Either way, the Guiding Lands remain a place of wonder. And danger. Just how the environment mimics every possible locale of the main continent, so too does the fauna, as every large creature found in a new world can also sporadically be found here. How exactly these populations came to live here is unknown, but it is assumed that the Guiding Lands are actually much, much larger and denser than the explored area. Thus, all creatures, from the Anjanath to the Xenogar, can periodically be spotted here. The real surprise, however, was the discovery that some old world monsters which do not have consistent populations on the new continent also appear in the Guiding Lands. More specifically, Many rare species, subspecies, and variants that used to only be seen in the old world seem to have also developed or migrated to this island. Among them, however, there is indication that some monsters that don't have any representation on the new world whatsoever also arrived here, completely new species that were previously only known in the old world, with one candidate already having been confirmed in the wild. The Yangaruga is at this point a very well-known monster to the guild, as it has terrorized hunters and civilians alike for generations. Known as the strongest bird wyvern, this aggressive avian now also prowls the guiding lands, as incorrigible as ever. With its large ears, it can detect any potential victim easily, and thanks to its slender body, it doesn't take long for it to run over and check. The Yangaruga is covered from head to toe in tough armor shelling, which protects it from blunt and slash type attacks, making it a cocky and assertive monster that will provoke and bully anything it sees. Once it finds a poor soul to harass, this bird has many ways to torment. Its hardened, spiky tail can inflict a noxious poison through its barbs, many times stronger than that used by related wyvern. 
From the front, the young Garuga can produce infernally hot fireballs from its mouth that are powerful enough to incinerate smaller targets. If it feels especially brutal, it can even resort to simply bludgeon its target with its massive and heavy beak. But the true danger of the young Garuga lies in its intelligence. Despite superficially resembling the bird-brained young Kutku, the young Garuga is an extremely intelligent creature that can identify traps and ambushes, string together attacks in order to maximize its power, and even set up feints for its target. It is this quality that allows this bird wyvern to clash with the titans of the ecosystem and come out unscathed. The young Garuga's brutal and selfish nature even extends to non-combat aspects of its life. For example, they are known brood parasites, meaning that they will lay their eggs into the nests of other bird wyverns, where the massive juvenile young Garuga will exploit the parental instincts of the nest owner to steal all the food meant for its actual offspring, often killing its foster siblings and foster parents eventually. As savage as this may seem, the young Garuga of the Guiding Lands cannot allow itself any weakness or compassion, as it walks in the presence of true beasts. The unique ecosystem of this island has, one way or another, facilitated the creatures that live on it to become much more powerful than on the mainland. A consequence of this is the emergence and appearance of subspecies, especially those that represent an increase in power over their regular counterparts. Were one to venture into the bowels of the island, where rot and magma intermingle, one would very quickly find one of these subspecies. Encounters with Brute Tigrex are fairly rare, but they always end in disaster. These brown foot wyvern are a subspecies of Tigrex particularly well adapted to living in rocky and volcanic regions, but just like the regular species, they are somewhat flexible in choosing what environment to terrorize. They were known to prowl remote locations in the Old World, and here, in the Guiding Lands, they patrol the harshest parts of it, the volcanic and rotten regions. Brute Tigrex are generally even more aggressive than regular Tigrex, due to their higher metabolism which is necessary to maintain their increased muscle mass. These and all other changes are the result of the Brute Tigrex's preference for mountainous and volcanic regions. Regular Tigrex are powerful because they can traverse almost any terrain, but they aren't truly specialized for any locale as a result. While the Brute Tigrex are also somewhat nomadic, their tendency to stick to volcanic mountain ranges allowed them to specialize in a way the regular species never could. Climbing mountains and competing with their powerful inhabitants pushed the Brute Tigrex to develop stronger and sturdier muscles, and the ash, soot and rock dust that hands out around volcanoes fused with the beast's hide to give it its signature coloration. Even the Brute Tigrex's most devastating and unique weapon developed due to this switch in habitat. For a Tigrex, its roar is an immensely valuable asset, as it is used for intimidation and power display. When traversing volcanoes, however, even the powerful lungs of the Tigrex cannot shout loud enough to not be drowned out by the roaring magma. Thus, the Brute Tigrex developed a mechanism to still come out on top and have its voice heard. Its upper abdominal muscles have adapted a new reflex, wherein they can explosively compress the beast's lungs and diaphragm in order to instantly release all the air within. By funneling this blast of wind into its enormous voice box, the Brute Tigrex turns its scream into a veritable sound cannon, which can easily be heard for dozens of kilometers, even in the vicinity of a volcano. Additionally, this turns the screams into actual weapons, as their explosive airwaves are now powerful enough to genuinely hurt anyone who is too close and allows them to pass through their body. The Brute Tigrex understands this and uses its explosive roars in tandem with its already considerable battle prowess to further decimate its enemies. It can release them as explosive blasts, or even produce and maintain a focused sonic beam that obliterates anything it hits directly. But not all evolutive changes happen this directly, and even this dramatically. Sometimes it is small alterations, innocuous differences that can have the biggest impact through their knock-on effects. One example of this is actually easily observable within the Guiding Lands. 
While the biomes roughly imitate the normal formations of the main continent, the enormous concentration of bioenergy naturally creates anomalies which have consequences for the entire biosphere. Specifically, plants that are usually extremely rare due to their high energy requirement are fairly abundant here, including the dragonfell berry. This unassuming plant is actually supremely valuable, as it is the only flora that naturally produces dragon energy, which is a powerful compound essential in anti-elder dragon weaponry. While generally extremely rare, they grow frequently within the Guiding Lands, which leads to an interesting ecological phenomenon. The Guiding Lands also house fulgur bugs, insects best known for entering into symbiosis with Xenogar. These bugs have a unique trait where they produce electricity as a byproduct of their metabolism. They normally feed on any plants or berries they can find, having virtually no preference. And because they are so abundant in the Guiding Lands, dragon fell berries often end up in their diet, where they begin changing the bugs and their metabolism. Due to their presence of dragon energy in their diet, the bugs transform into dracophage bugs, a sort of secondary evolutionary stage wherein they begin producing not electricity, but dragon energy through the metabolism, kickstarted by the dragonfell berries. This isn't unique to the Guiding Lands. The old world has seen dracophage bugs emerge in numerous areas where dragonfell berries were abundant. And because these bugs partner up with Xenogar, their change also quickly led to the emergence of a Xenogar subspecies. The Stygian Xenogar, called the Hell Wolf. The Stygian Xenogar is actually not that different from a regular Xenogar in terms of biology. Despite their drastically different appearance, their bodies and mechanisms function the same. All the tissue and organs originally meant to control and store electricity are now simply converted into equivalent organs that harness the dragon energy received from the dracophage bugs. The color changes are also a result of dragon energy seeping into the beast and becoming part of its tissue, as it desaturates natural pigmentation while itself glowing red with the Xenogar's veins. The biggest difference between sub and regular species of Xenogar here is behavior. The Stygian Xenogar is much more desperate and aggressive, as it has to constantly fuel its dracophage bugs with rare berries, which they now prefer greatly. Due to those berries being abundant in the Guiding Lands, the New World Stygian Xenogar is actually more laid back than its Old World counterpart. Should it need to, however, it is just as fierce, directing the Dark of Age bugs with precision and power the regular Xenogar could never reach. This direction takes shape in complex formations that end up with massive lightning storms appearing all over the beast, making sure that any enemy will think twice about engaging. But subspecies aren't the only genetic variations possible for a monster. The guild recognizes a further type of evolutionary branch, the rare species. These are functionally identical to subspecies in that they are genetically different branches of a main family. The difference is revealed by its name. Rare species are exceptionally difficult to find, as they are defined by their tendency to only develop under the harshest of conditions. Researchers within the guild have even suggested that rare species are actually subspecies of subspecies, a branch of a branch. This theory is heavily contested, however. Whatever the case may be, rare species are a, well, rare sight, and a fearsome one too, as they are often many times more powerful than any monster in their wider family. The Guiding Land's unique ecosystem was quickly theorized to be a perfect habitat for these elusive creatures, as it features both remote areas and an abundance of energy to feed on. And sure enough, Two rare species were identified, Silver Rathalos and Gold Rathian, colloquially referred to as the Metal Raths. Both of these rare species were already discovered in the Old World long ago, but they nonetheless remain elusive due to their rarity. A few key discoveries have been made, however, partially thanks to the efforts of the Research Commission with the New World Species. 
Their metallic hide is many times more durable and thick than that of the regular species, and the added weight of that hide increases the muscle mass in the metal rafts in order to allow for swift movement and flight. This is functionally the same mechanism as the evolution the Azure Rathalos underwent. This hide has been theorized to be similar to that of the Kushala Daura, a coat of fused metallic minerals. Evidence for it is the surprisingly severe weakness to thunder the metal rafts, especially Silver Rathalos, exhibit, suggesting that their hide may be highly conductive. Besides that, however, this hide is sturdy and reliable, allowing a Gold Rathian, for example, to attack head-on without worrying about its skull the way the regular species and its brittle head armor have to. Moreover, both the Silver Rathalos and the Gold Rathian are overall more agile and more physically powerful than their regular species. Curiously, these two rare species exhibit a unique difference here in the Guiding Lands compared to those found in the Old World. The guild has long since known that metal rafts hold more firepower than regular rafts, but generally that's where their change in elemental power ended. The New World metal rafts, however, seem to have developed a vastly augmented fire sack, as they can allow burning liquid to circulate within their chest in order to both facilitate flight through thermic levitation and to generate infernal fire blasts that explode as blinding white novas. In this state, the metal rafts are at their most powerful, being able to incinerate anything they please within a moment's notice. The Guiding Lands often become the scene for such spectacle. Its remote location, abundant energy, and fierce competition promote and attract the most powerful versions of extant monsters. Subspecies and rare species, yes, but also variants, powerful individuals born as normal monsters transformed within their individual lifetime. This meant that it was only a matter of time until the old and new world's most infamous invasive species would make an appearance. While the regular Devil Joe is a force to be reckoned with anywhere else, in the Guiding Lands it struggles to compete, as too many powerful foes congregate. This causes it to go hungry for extended periods of time. And that is exactly where the terror begins. Devil Joe have an enormous metabolism, and the resulting hunger is what fuels their aggression. This hunger is called forth by the beast's enormous muscles, but also by the strain of keeping the Devil Joe's trump card in check, its dragon sack. This organ can produce dragon energy, a powerful weapon for sure, and a dangerous one. Should a Devil Joe become injured, hungry, or otherwise suffer for an extended period of time, this organ can get out of control and flood the wyvern's body with copious amounts of dragon energy. At that point, exhaustion vanishes and the Devil Joe is transformed into a terrifying variant. The Savage Devil Joe. If a regular Devil Joe was already a nightmare to deal with, then a Savage Devil Joe is a disaster walker. Due to the constant flow of dragon energy, its muscles are constantly swollen to their maximum size, its strength nigh on unrivaled. The black smoke and crimson arcs spew out from everywhere, allowing the beast to use its dragon breath much more liberally. This increased power allows the savage Devil Joe to consume endlessly in an attempt to recover. Unfortunately, once infected with this rage, Nothing will satiate its hunger, as the dragon energy dissolves its cells faster than the Devil Joe can regenerate them through normal nutrition. And yet it tries, even going as far as to cannibalize other Devil Joe, which of course only increases the dragon flow within, creating a vicious cycle. Before long, the face of the savage Devil Joe becomes entirely cloaked in dark mist of destruction, as it barrels towards more prey, more violence, more death. Fortunately for every other creature in the vicinity, this process is self-destructive. After an undeterminate amount of time, the Devil Joe simply won't be able to offset the Draconic Surge any longer and finally succumb to its exhausted state, ending its reign of terror. The Guiding Lands hold many such fierce adversaries, monsters that develop into unstoppable forces. Some do so by necessity, 
and some, like the Brachidios, appear in these lands for a different reason altogether, a purpose related to their slime. Generally, the slime that falls off a Brachidios explodes shortly after in order to spread its spores as it is intended. However, rarely, this process does not occur, as the slime doesn't manage to hit the heat, mass and build up required in time and the reaction simply subsides. In these cases, the slime in question seeps into the ground and becomes incubated within the crust of the earth. Due to the high pressure conditions under the surface, the slime becomes focused and compressed, making it more resilient, explosive and powerful. After countless years of building and building under the surface, volcanic and tectonic activity force it back out into the open, where it unveils its newfound power and gains a new name. The Flashpoint Slime This powerful, darker slime mold can technically emerge anywhere, but has a particular abundancy in places where there is both much volcanic activity and many battles fought by Brachidios in the past. Thus, certain locations, like the Old World's Ingle Isle, become regular hotspots for flashpoint activity. The Guiding Lands are one such site, as the bioenergy and fierce competition of the lands make it very easy for the flashpoint to emerge. And these temples of fire and brimstone are of utmost importance to the Brachidios' race. As sexual competition rises, some male Brachidios become, through an as of yet unknown mechanism, instinctually aware of the existence of the Flashpoint slime. They then embark on a sort of pilgrimage to the aforementioned hotspots, including the Guiding Lands, for one purpose. To bind themselves to the Flashpoint. The vibrant coloration and the immense firepower of this variant slime mold signifies a clear display of sexual dominance and all but guarantees breeding privileges. But this binding is not easily earned. As if the journey to the far off depths of the Guiding Lands wasn't enough, the Flashpoint slime's added power is no small burden. While an adult Brachidios' shell can usually withstand the normal slime mold's continuous explosions, Many of them succumb and die after having their armor ripped to shreds by the fury of the Flashpoint. Only the strongest and largest individuals can survive the Flashpoint slime. And only they are granted the right to ascend into a new form, into a variant. The Raging Brachidios It is a misconception that the Flashpoint slime makes a bound Brachidios bigger or stronger. Rather, it is only the biggest and strongest Brachidios that survive the binding, hence the size and power of this variant. This is the peak of the Brachidios' race, an old, wise and exceptionally powerful individual now bound to the most deadly and destructive slime mold in existence. The vibrant blue and purple shell of the regular Brachidios has been molded and shaped into the darker, indestructible ebon shell, capable of withstanding more heat and bombardment. And such bombardment is sure to come, as the Raging Brachidios fights with a newfound ferocity and strength that few can equal. Armed with new, more powerful explosions, this variant has been granted the most precise and deadly control over blast and destruction seen in nature. Part of that is a very special hormonal gland. While in regular Brachidios it controlled the priming and long distance activating of the mold via hormones and pheromones, the binding with the Flashpoint has mutated it into what scholars now call an Immortal Reactor. This mysterious organ allows much more concentrated amounts of hormones and pheromones to be controlled more precisely over longer distances. This means that the Raging Brachidios has no trouble activating slime that is several meters away from it, as well as activating the slime on its own body much more effectively. The powerful Flashpoint also adds to this as it is much more active than its normal counterpart, growing and priming itself in regular intervals, to the point where its own weight causes it to fall off the beast in chunks. A raging Brachidios is, as the name suggests, incredibly aggressive and always prepared to measure itself against its rivals. Its newfound position at the top of the sexual hierarchy bestows upon it an urgency to defend its title. But should, against all odds, an opponent prove too tough even for this, the Raging Brachidios will initiate its final gambit. 
Upon being overwhelmed, the beast will seek out the deepest depths of the volcanic region of the Guiding Lands, not as a retreat from its adversary, but as an invitation to them. An invitation to a final showdown. Once there, the Brachidios will recklessly empty its immortal reactor into the surrounding air and begin pushing the Flashpoint slime to its absolute limit. Gone will be the hard-earned dark green coloration of its shell, replaced by the charred black of countless explosions, covered in a billowing mass of steam and smoke. In this final assault, the Brachidios throws everything it has at its enemy to the point where it endangers its own life. The force of continuous flashpoint detonations is more than capable of pulverizing even its marvelous ebon shell if the fight lasts for too long. The raging Brachidios shakes the earth with countless repeated fiery explosions, the thundering roar of a beast's wrathful struggle to endure. Flesh burns, stone melts, and the air distorts with the brimming heat of the raging Brachidios' immortal heart, which beckons for a fight that will, inevitably, end one of the lives involved. A brutal, final match to the death in the flaming embrace of Mother Earth. With all the exciting discoveries within the Guiding Lands, it's easy to forget what initially led the guild here. The anomalous Nergigante had vanished into the island, and it was only gradually that its mystery was uncovered. During the Everworm incident, the ecosphere of the New World fundamentally shifted, leading to new challenges and evolutionary pressures that would force all the creatures on the continent to adapt and accommodate. One species that was of particular interest here was the Nergigante. As it reproduces asexually, its genes do not get reshuffled and as such, it has very limited potential for adaptation. Sexual reproduction and the resulting 50-50 split of parental genes are a massive part of how natural selection works, and asexual species tend to react somewhat bizarrely to this situation. While the Nergigante, as opposed to some other affected species, did not manage to emerge as a new subspecies, thus supporting a conclusion that its asexual reproduction hinders its evolution, it did show that individual Nergigante have a decent degree of adaptability. It began becoming more violent and more vicious in its pursuit of the other elder dragons. The oldest and the most experienced specimens managed to adapt and change so much that they turned into the only classified variant of the species. The Ruiner Nergigante. It was this variant that led the guild to the Guiding Lands, but it would be a long time before it was properly understood. Superficially not vastly different, Ruiner Nergigante sports a slightly darker coloration to its regular counterpart. Additionally, and most imposingly, it has incorporated a second type of spike into its body. These new spikes are crystalline, and much harder than its regular spikes, but they also grow significantly slower. They are coated in a potent blood thinning agent, which makes the blood that comes into contact with it thinner and more liquid, causing stronger blood flow in the wounds it creates, thus resulting in heavy bleeding and blood loss in any victims. But the most striking and most crucial difference is the beast's intelligence. Nergigante is by no means a dull monster, but its drive to consume and to combat are relatively simplistic. Ruiner Nergigante, however, is quite different. It exhibits a much more cunning, calculative, and planning temperament. When in combat, it starts out slow and steady, using minimal movements so as to not waste energy on an opponent that might not be worth it. But, as it begins sustaining damage, it will violently increase its ferocity, carefully dialing its strength up alongside its analysis of the encounter's difficulty. During the aforementioned siege on the Everworm, the Ruiner Nergigante that would lead us to the Guiding Lands was even seen playing dead in order to await the perfect opportunity to take down its prey. Through our research, our exploration and our growth, it is easy for us humans to fall into this idea that we understand the world and its rules. We become arrogant, we believe ourselves to be the pioneers of knowledge. But every once in a while, we discover something like the Guiding Lands, a reality check. For all our progress, we still encounter the inexplicable, the mysterious, the impossible. 
we know frighteningly little. We are frighteningly small. But is that not the point? Our providence as humanity is not control or omniscience, but rather the opportunity to find unexpected beauty and value everywhere. Is it not a privilege to inhabit a world so wondrous, so awe-inspiring, that even after generations of study and work, we can still stumble onto sights that leave our mouths agape and our hearts ablaze? Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, a special thank you to all of our patrons, including Karthair, Fiction Ape, Sini, Courage, Alex, Eric Nelson, Iron Camel, Jameson Tate, Joshua, Ludenther, Paracha, Peroscoco, Project Iceman, that's just Ash. Wisdom Manari. Mr. Meander. And Geo. I'll see you all next time. Be safe and stay well. Bye bye.